we're just stepping into a very brand new series called Shattered Dreams, Unshakable Faith. But before we even just t- jump into that topic, I want to ask you this question. When you consider, when you think about the word detour, think about the word detour. Anybody ever experienced detours in your life? Any of you ever gone through an experience where you have been driving somewhere and maybe as recently as this past week in the city of Collinsville, major roads have been shut down, have have caused you to say, hey, do I really know my town? Do I really know how to navigate this place? And it's, 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 it's crazy to think that there was a time, it's crazy for me to think, that there was a time where maps on paper were all that you had. It was crazy to think that maps were the only thing that guided you. And I actually have thought to myself it would be great to throw a bunch of millennial Gen Zers in a car without their GPS and say, hey, get there. I need you to get to Wally World because getting there is half the fun. But why? Why is it the detours throw us off? because they go against the pattern of our journey that maybe we're used to. And I'm wondering in your own life, could you navigate some things if the GPS, if the directions that you were used to always having weren't there? Or if the belief systems that you had were not getting you to where you needed to go? In your own journey, are there places where detours are more common? And on your way to your dream, it seems all you experience is detours. Maybe to the fact that you give up on your dream. There's a willingness in you to lay down your dream because the pain of detours isn't worth it. So I'm wondering this morning, church, do you identify with that in your own story? Can you see that in your own life where detours throw you off? Frustrate your faith versus feed your faith. But I want to encourage you as we step into this series today, Shattered Dreams, Unshakable Faith, we're going to look at it through the lens of the life of Joseph. And when we look at the life of Joseph, here's what we see. We see a dreamer. Even his brother saw, say, here comes the dreamer. It records that in his story. And even today, we can say he's Joseph, king of dreams. They made a movie about it. And he's so branded with dreams, but do you know he was so branded with detours just the same? He was branded with a story that begins with a dream, but is marked by dysfunctions and detours. But here's the thing. God used every one of those dysfunctions, every one of those detours in order to get him where he was going. And so I'm wondering, church, in your own life, is there a place, is there a space, is there a time where it begins with a dream and you just need to say it out loud? Because when Joseph steps onto the scene, that's what we find him doing. We see him sharing the dream that God has given him. And we find this account in Genesis 37, 5 through 10. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Well, this is going to get interesting. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream and what he had said. Let's stop there for a moment. Can we pick up on a family dynamic here? Can we pick up on a family dysfunction here? Okay, not just me. Hate, hate, hate is coming into the passage twice here because he shares it. But... Joseph is about 17 year olds and from serving as a student ministry director, I know generally what the tone today of the know-it-all generation is. And this is not to step on their toes. Young people, I love your confidence. Let's just put some Christ on it. 
And so here's what I want to do. I want to say, I think Joseph was walking in some Joseph confidence. And he was stepping out his walk and he's like, brothers, I'm the youngest, but you're going to bow at my feet. And can I tell you, I know this as the baby of the family. Babies rock on. But what we see here is I pick up on an attitude that they hated him all the more. How did they get to hate so fast unless there's a history of favoritism on this young man? Oh, yeah, there is. His dad had a special coat made for him because, hey, this one's my favorite. Parents, that's a lesson for you. I don't have to draw the principle out there for you. But he had clothed himself with favor, and so he had favor from the father, but this disrupted the brothers naturally. And so they hated him for sharing, and the attitude and the place of confidence, should I say misguided confidence, led him to a place where, guess what, brothers? Bow down to me. And I can understand maybe the brother's position because of his attitude and sharing the dream. As you begin to share your dream, can I just help, help you pump the brakes? It's not about you. But you'll get to work on that in the coming weeks. But let's continue on. So he's just had the dream, just shared the dream. Pick up in verse 9. Next slide. Then he had another dream. Oh, boy. And he told it to his brothers. He said, listen, I had another dream, and I'm about to tell you that I'm right again. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. There will be times where you say your dream out loud. There will be times that other people say their dream out loud to you, and you may just have to listen and let them sit in their dream and allow God to shape it. The brothers responded out of jealousy because they're still functioning in immaturity. We have the father who's saying, okay, I don't know if I agree with this because of just the natural order of the family, but I'm going to ponder this in my heart. I'm going to keep this close to the chest because maybe there's a history in this family of dreams. Maybe there's a history in this family of God's faithfulness. Maybe there's also a history in this family of dysfunction. But his father Jacob knows enough to say, let's go with God on this one and see what he can do. But here's what I want you to do. You're going to say this a few times with me. I need you to say this with me. I am Joseph. Awesome, we're halfway on to the point. Here we go. I am Joseph because you have a dream inside of you. And you need to say it out loud. And then you need to be prepared for detours. But why do we even experience detours on the way to the dream? Because detours may make you want to quit. But I'm here to tell you today, it's time to push, not just through the detours, but push into Jesus to find your way through the detours. Because I don't know. There's this family dynamic that you've already picked up on the text. And maybe you have a family dynamic of dysfunction in your family. Don't all say them at once because they're all going to be a little bit different. I know in my family, the minute I married into a different family, just holiday parties themselves proved to be, oh, not so much di dysfunction as just a different way of doing things. My wife's family, they love appetizers, and I, I can get on board with the appetizers, but like they, they put them out, there's a huge plate full of, app, table full of appetizers, and then they feast, and they feast, and they feast, 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 and then they step towards the meal, and then they get to my favorite part of the meal, can you help me out? Yeah. Dessert. The Samonic family starts with dessert, because life is too short, and you don't want to miss it. So maybe not dysfunction, but maybe just a disruption to the way of life that I've always been used to it. But maybe in your own life, the dysfunction can be something as, I get angry a lot. Actually, I have a history of anger in my, my family. I'm saying this about 
you're, you, maybe you, not, not me, um, but maybe that's your thing. And maybe you're just so driven by a competitive nature that every one of your family parties disrupts into chaos and arguing because you're relitigating the rules of rummy and what wins over what. And you have to consult your magic card. And like, there's a whole thing. And like, bring in the refs, second opinion, call a flag on the play. And like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And that dysfunction somehow works for you. But maybe the dysfunction is a little bit more serious. Maybe the very dysfunction that you're walking in, that you're functioning in, is robbing you from the dream that God has for you. Maybe it's this that there's a history of alcoholism in my family. And I want to break the dysfunction, but I just can't get out. There's a history of abuse in my family, but I just can't figure out how to get out. And there's this dream in their heart, and you want to say it out loud, but you know the minute you say it, the family dynamic will squash you and hate you for it. And as we're going to find in a moment, may even want to kill you for it. Because maybe your dysfunction doesn't go as far as wanting to kill one of your brothers. But that's where our story goes with Joseph. Because he goes out to find his brothers. And in the midst of him searching for his brothers, we realize just how far this dysfunction goes. Because as he finds his brothers keeping the flock out in the field and he goes to check on them, they say, here comes that dreamer, followed up with, I have an idea, why don't we kill him? And then Reuben says, well, no, let's, let's maybe not kill him. Let's throw him in that pit. So then they're like, have him in a pit. And then they're sitting there thinking like, hmm, let's just really make sure we got the motive right. Let's really make sure we uh, crime case this thing out, make sure we cover all of our bases. And then a caravan of slave traders come. And then they say, let's not just sell off our brother. Let's sell him out. And they sell him down the road to slavery. And it seems like the very dream that was bursting inside of him is experiencing his first detour from those that are closest to him. I'll tell you, there are places in your life where you cannot pick your family. You cannot pick the dysfunction that you may be born into. But you can choose to step out of it. You can choose to take a step towards more of what God has for him. But yeah, let's get back to this history of dysfunction. Because we have Joseph's brothers rooted in jealousy, sought to kill Joseph, but ended up selling him off for financial gain. And then they lied to their father about it. The ultimate result of dysfunction is deceit. That is grounded in a lie. And this dysfunction materialized in literally lying to their father saying he was killed by wolves here's his coat that we actually just put other blood on and they be began to deceive their father how messed up is that but it didn't start with Joseph's brothers. Actually, if we begin to journey out and we look at towards uh, their father, Jacob. Okay, remember the father who thought Joseph was the father? Let's look at Jacob, Joseph's father. He lied in order to get a blessing from his own father. He says, you see, I see something I want. And even though it was something contained in the heart of God, he went about a wrong way, a dysfunctional way of getting it through deceit, through dysfunction. Well, where'd he learn that from? Let's talk about Isaac, Joseph's grandfather. He lied about who his wife was. He was going through a place and they said, oh, who is that? And he was worried they were going to kill her. He was worried they were going to take him for himself. He's like, ah, oh, that's my sister. What happened is so dysfunctional within us that that which is most closest to us, we feel we need to lie about. What dysfunction, what deceit is rooted in our humanity that makes us think self-preservation versus God provision is the choice we make. But okay, Jacob learned it from Isaac. Well, where did Isaac learn it from? Let's talk about Abraham. Abraham, Joseph's great-grandfather, lied about who his wife was twice. He didn't learn. And then he laughed 
at the very possibility of the, the dream that God had for his life. The promise that God gave him that you're going to bear a son. You're going to have a child, and it's going to be great. And he laughed it off. Yes, because of natural circumstances, but how many times do we laugh at God's provision and laugh at God's plan because our personal plan doesn't align? We buy into the lie that God can't bring us through the detours. And that's the great deceit, the great dysfunction of humanity that we can track all the way back to the garden. But I want to tell you, don't let your dysfunctional family, your dysfunctional life keep you from functioning in your dream. Because a dysfunction, hear me when I say this, a dysfunction is not the same thing as a mist function. Because the devil knows he can't get you out of purpose. He can just get you off of purpose. He can't just get you out of the truth. He just needs to get you deceived from the truth that you begin just a little compromise in the dream until you realize you're walking out a compromised dream that ends in a nightmare versus saying, okay, Church, can we bring ourselves back to where is our dysfunction? Where is our deceit? Where is the great lie that we're telling to ourselves that is robbing us of our dream, that is keeping us from functioning in our dream? But church, I'm here to tell you, you have not missed your function. Young people, you're not too young. Old people, you're not too old. Your function is still in the hands of a faithful father. I'm just saying, are you taking your praise there? Are you taking your prayers there? Are you taking your family there? Are you taking the worst parts of yourself and bringing them to Jesus and said, I am messed up, but you're good. And in the history of your dysfunction, you allow an interruption because when we look over the history of dysfunction in this family, we see a history of God-given dreams, God-given interventions, God-given faithfulness, and the history that is being rewritten in this family is the same history that is available to you today. So I'm here to say, when we look at the life of Joseph, yes, positively a family of dysfunction. I'm Joseph. But when I look at the life of Joseph and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I see a family of dreams. Because when we work our way back, Abraham, Joseph's grandfather, we see this, he made a new covenant with God in the midst of his dysfunction, in the midst of his detour. And he started a new family, a new nation, which was God's dream. Then we see Isaac, Joseph's grandfather, served God's dream given to his father Abraham and pursued passionately his dream for a family when it came to his wife and his children. Isaac, who was found in deceit because of his dysfunction, got a taste of his own medicine when he says, I want to marry that girl. And so he made a conversation happen with the father-in-law to be and said, hey, Laban. I want her. The problem is he wanted the younger of the two daughters. And then so he goes in this journey and he, he gets, goes through the marriage ceremony. He wakes up the next morning like, oh, that's the wrong sister. And so he goes to his father-in-law. You can all imagine what his uh, response was. And his father-in-law Laban says, yeah, you're going to have to work seven years for the next one. And he did it. Because the one who was found in deceit before suddenly says, you know what? The shortcut's never worth it. The plan that God has for me may take longer, but she's worth it. But it's worth it. And later scripture even records that he says those seven years were not for a moment. If I can talk to all the single people here today, if you're in that phase of life, I'm here to tell you if you truly just run into the arms of Jesus, if you truly trust him with your journey, if you say, God, I trust my, that man. I trust that young lady. I trust my future. I trust my future marriage. I trust what you have in the midst of my decision function, God, you need to function. And the wait is not for a moment when you rest 
in the arms of Jesus. So that's Isaac. Come on, this family's redeeming itself. Jacob, Jacob's father. Okay, we're getting closer to Joseph. Served God's dream given to his father and his grandfather, and he expanded on a new dream God gave to him. And this is when he laid down and he saw a vision of a ladder, and on it were angels ascending and descending. You can research that for yourself. But here's what I see in that picture. God says, hey, I'm giving you a dream, but now I'm going to help facilitate your dream. And what the dream that is inside of you needs happen is supernatural intervention. Some of you are trying to function in your natural gift instead of the supernatural provision of God. And some of you just love cruising through the boat towards your dream when we serve the God that says, get out of the boat, walk on the water, do the impossible. Your dream should not be possible within your own reach. If you are, you're just imagining what your reality can look like tomorrow in your own competence. God of the impossible gives the dream, so why would we ever think it's possible on our own? So Jacob gets it. Supernatural intervention is gonna have to come. Supernatural intervention is gonna have to happen. And then we get to Reuben, Joseph's brother who spoke up. And yeah, he didn't get it fully right. But can I believe that supernatural intervention said, hey, let's not kill him. That was option A. Let's not just throw him in the pit where he'll eventually die. Let's sell him off. Wouldn't have been my plan. And even though he chose a route that seemed wrong, God used it. Because option A, option B, would have seen a nation in famine without a savior 20 years from then. God used what the enemy meant for evil and turned it for good. So Joseph, Joseph served God's dream given to his father, his grandfather and grand, great grandfather and goes on to give his life for the new dream God placed in him. Here's the thing. We're not going to go any deeper into Joseph's story today. That's going to be the following weeks where we're going to chase down these different detours. But here's what I want to make sure you, you see. In your life, can you say, I am Joseph? I am Joseph. Because here's what I see. is A dysfunctional person has never stopped a functioning God. Because where we see dysfunction led to deceit, the dream leads to a conception of truth. And are you willing that you have to know, I need to say my dream out loud, but then I need to conceive within me the truth that God wants me to know about my dream. This is what I think Joseph missed at the beginning but it was a dysfunction, not a misfunction. So the grace of God said, okay, we're gonna keep stewarding the dream. God's gonna keep stewarding your dream, but can you say there may be a deception, a dysfunction in my current life that I need to give over to Jesus who is fully f functioning and he needs to give me a dream to conceive on the inside that is a truth because a dysfunctional person in the hands of a fully functioning God brings about a dream in a way we never thought detours. So that's what we're going to find over the coming weeks. Detours. Here's what I'm going to guarantee you when you chase your dream. Detours. Here's what I believe that you're going to find when you believe you have a good day and then a bad day comes. Detours. But do you serve the God of detours or do you serve the God of Abraham? Isaac and Jacob, because if you serve the God of detours, you see that as a roadblock. And all that I know is I serve a God that says, ooh, a stepping block to get me higher into what I'm supposed to do. There's a level of strength that is developed because there's not just a family history of dysfunction. There's not just a family history of dreams. There is a different family history, but I need to make sure. Are you with me? Say this with me. I am Joseph. You have a dream inside of you, you need to say it out loud, and then you need to be prepared for detours. But why do we experiencing the, 
experience these detours because detours to dream ensure a foundation of faith. Detours to your dreams establish a foundation to your faith. Because if we serve the God of the impossible, it may seem like we have to face some impossible things. But stop looking at the impossible as a closed door versus one you may just have to knock a little bit harder at. Because we have a history of dysfunction. We have a history of of dreams, but what is it all working towards? We're looking, working towards a history of faith. Hebrews 11, the faith hall of fame. By the way, this is a couple thousand years after Joseph is here and gone. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are here and gone. But he, here in Hebrews 11, 8 through 17, begins by saying this, by faith, Abraham. We keep going on, Hebrews eleven twenty, 20, by faith, Isaac. We keep moving through, Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21, by faith, Jacob. We keep going, Hebrews eleven twenty two. we wrap up this story. By faith, Joseph, not by dysfunction, not by a dream, but by faith in Jesus, by faith in God, by faith in Christ, in Christ alone, can you begin to say, I am caught in a pit. I've been sold into slavery. I'm going to be lied about. I'm going to be demoted. I'm going to be put into prison. How many more detours can I take? And God says, as long as it takes that this detour is still getting you to where I am taking you your dream here's what we do when we say yes to Jesus we surrender our journey we surrender our what right there my Jesus went to a garden before he went to the cross and can I imagine the stress of that moment and he sat in intercession and said, God, if it be your will, let this pass from me. This is not a detour I want to take, but not my will, but yours be done. Some, need, some of you need to baptize your dream in not my will, but yours be done. You need to take your dream to Jesus. You need to take, your, you need to take that barren womb, and you need to begin to speak Jesus to it. You need to baptize it in the truth that I don't care what the report is. I believe the report of the Lord. He did it for Abraham. He can do it for you. And if you step into that dream, and you're like, I'm supposed to open this business, but this this town doesn't want me. I think I'm supposed to be here. And God's like, no, they don't want you because I don't need you there. Oh, maybe I should try a different place. Your will, your way. That's why it takes faith. That's, not why, that's why it's not a dream we can come up with. That's not it's a dream we can achieve through our own dysfunction, but by Jesus. Because I want to say this phrase to you. Dreams aren't the seedbed of your faith. Faith is the seedbed for your dreams. The first allows you to have a conditional faith on if your genie God makes your wish come true. And I'm just here to say that's not my God, and he's not mean because he does it that way. He's faithful because he does it that way. He's sovereign because he does it that way. He knows more because he does it that way. He's bigger than I am because he does it that way. He is God, and I am, uh oh not. I'm Joseph, and I need Jesus. I said we weren't going to read about the rest of his story, but we are, one time. Let's fast forward. Genesis 50, 20. Joseph is now standing in his dreams. And here's his response. What you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is being done now the saving of many lives. You need to hear that again. Brothers who sold me out, brothers 
who wanted to kill my dream, detours who wanted to keep me out. You intended to harm me, but faith, but God intended it for the good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. But God intended it for the good, what is being done now, that you will all bow down to me. Wasn't that the dream? But God has intended it for good. Stars, moon, sun, bow down to me. That was the dream, wasn't it? Could it be that his attitude has changed over the course of his detours? Or can we say it this way? His faith has been grounded in order for the dreams to be birthed in the way they're supposed to. 22 years between his dream and realizing it. I am so sorry you live in an instant society that tells you you get what you want on credit whenever you want. God doesn't function on a credit line. He functions on Jesus who covers every gap of our dysfunction, who helps us step towards the dream that he has for us in every beautiful way. Speaking with a parent this week, has a child that is passionate about athletics, has a sport that they want to try out for, sustained an injury, and they don't know what tryouts are going to look like. Now if we can make it personal, a kid doesn't know what his future looks like. Because to a kid, you may think, it's just, it's, it's, it'll all, this is this kid's life. And I believe if I got into your dreams too, your dream is your life, if you really want to be honest about it. But you're walking with this injury. You're functioning in this injury, and you want to step towards your dream with this injury. And the parent was just saying to me, like, I, I don't know how to get them through this moment. I don't know how to encourage them to just keep pressing on. I want to encourage them to know that they are bigger than this moment, even though this moment matters. And just as quick as I could form the words, this, this, I feel like God was saying to me, and I said it to this parent, I said, hey, what God promotes, he protects. Amen. And that re is relevant to this Young person, that is relevant to your journey, and maybe you're afraid to step out in your dream because you don't want to get hurt. But if hurt's your only motivation, how will you ever achieve hope? Unless you trust and believe that the God of the impossible has given you an impossible dream without him. Built in every one of us a need for him and a need for Jesus. So I'm going to say a few phrases, and if you identify with these, say, I am Joseph. God gives us dreams. We are dysfunctional. Life brings us detours. I hope today you've realized you're more like Joseph than you might have imagined. And that on the way to your dreams, you will experience detours. And over the, step, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to walk through some of those detours. And I need you to be ready to say your dream out loud. But the dream that God's given inside of you, it's now time to give it back to Jesus. Say your will, your way. You're more than enough. It may look like a pit. It may look like I'm sold out. But Jesus has me. That's the journey we're on. That through it all, he is God. Through it all, he has you. Through it all, he holds you. Your dysfunctions, your dreams, but what he's building, your faith. Go ahead and bow your heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives that lead us in the way everlasting. That God, I know if we just lined people up and we began to say, hey, what's your dream? There would be some of those that could say it right for a moment very quickly. 
There could be others who have buried it so far. They need to do some healing work to find it. So God, I bless those journeys over the next couple weeks and speak that we serve a God that redeems the dream. I speak that promise over your family, over you. For the ones who are scared to pursue their dream, I speak to the fear and I say faith. To the ones who are functioning out of hurt, I speak hope, I speak healing. But I thank you that over the course of this next couple weeks, we practice what we have heard from the Father's heart this morning, that we are dysfunctional. But you give us dreams as a means to grow our faith. And the beauty of Joseph's journey is, can be the beauty of ours over the next couple weeks, that when we step into our dream, it's not, look what I've achieved. It's a humble, gracious attitude that says, look what God has done. So the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of Mary, Odell, Heather, Eric, and I could go around the room and say each and every one of your names, but guess what? Somebody already beat it to me, beat me to it. Jesus knows your name. He's given you your dream, and he's in the detours, and he's growing your faith. Let's take this journey together. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen.